I want to stop before we go into the next part and just ask uh, any reflections, any you know, questions before we dive into the next section that you're kind of sitting on a little bit. I'll give you a chance to do that. Otherwise, I'll just, some people, we'd spend a lot of time during the lunchtime going over some, but maybe you didn't get the chance to do that and you still want to. Otherwise, I'm just going to take us through the next part, so. All right. We'll go. Um... I want to just, first of all, encourage you, if you haven't done it, to, um, to make, make a de- have some kind of definition of what you mean a di- when you say a disciple, and, and also what you mean by discipleship. And I've, I've found that a lot of times people don't really know what they're talking about when they say those words. So you say, hey, we're committed to be disciples who make disciples. Well, what does that mean? Um, and so for, for me, the way I've been learning to communicate uh, what discipleship is, is it's, it's leading others to increasingly submit all of life to the lordship and empowering presence of Jesus. So discipleship is leading others to increasingly submit all of life to the lordship and empowering presence of Jesus. So that's, that's how I've been using it. Um, a disciple, and I would start with Matthew 4, 19 and go to Matthew 28. A disciple is one who worships Jesus, because remember Jesus says, follow me. And at the end, we see them worshiping him. So one who worships Jesus and is being changed by Jesus. Remember he says, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. So at the end, they're different, but they're still needing to continually be changed. So they have a new identity, but he's constantly calling them to live that life. So a disciple worships Jesus as being changed by Jesus and increasingly obeys Jesus in all of life. Remember, he says, I teach them to obey everything I've commanded you. So, so that's, that's how I've defined it. You can work through your own, but I'd encourage you to have one because that whole idea of worshiping Jesus is, hey, I know who God is and what he's done. I'm coming to love him and worship him and serve him. Is being changed by Jesus. I know I'm a new creation, and therefore I'm being transformed. And obeys Jesus more and more. I do what he says because of what he's done for me. So that's how I'm defining it. But you can work through your own, but you've you got to have one, because if you don't know what you're trying to develop in people, you'll just kind of just do whatever, and you'll, you'll lack a plan. So I encourage you to think through that. Now with that, it said... I'm convinced that if discipleship is increasingly leading, leading people to increasingly submit all of life to the lordship and empowering presence of Jesus, then discipleship can't happen in a classroom. Because you can't lead people to all of life submission just by talking about it. You actually have to be with them. So I've found that discipleship requires three kind of environments. One, life on life, where life is visible and accessible. Okay, so... If you, if you want to help someone learn how to follow Jesus in all of life, they're going to have to see you follow Jesus in all of life, and you're going to have to be able to watch them to see if they're following Jesus in all of life. Now, here's the challenge. You can't do that with everybody. You just can't. So you're going to have to do it with a few who then do it with a few and so on and so forth. It takes a while to build a team of disciple makers. But it's worth taking the time to do it with a few because then they can do it with more and more and more, and it'll actually multiply. Like um, Ro and Anita... Anita's right here. They got to spend eight weeks, was about eight, with living with Randy and Lisa? Ten. Ten weeks. And so they got to experience life-on-life discipleship with Randy and Lisa. And that was probably, probably what you got in those ten weeks is more than what most Christians get in years in the church because they don't usually get that close to someone pressing into their life and helping them and thinking through it. So you can imagine if every leader in the church said, I'm going to take two or three people and I'm going to do that with them intensely for a period of time, and then I'm going to train them how to do it with others. It wouldn't take many years until you'd have a whole bunch of people who can make disciples in the church. But we don't tend to put a lot of time into a few. We, try, we tend to put a, a very little bit of time into many. And then we don't really have many who can know how to make disciples. So I'd encourage you to think about that, life on life. An example would be like Randy, just to come back to him, he had no idea what it looked like to be a, a, a husband who loves Jesus and a father who loves Jesus. He'd never seen one. 
His dad was a, a terrible dad, a terrible husband. Left his wife, abandoned his kids, physically abused them, verbally abused them. And he doesn't know what it looks like. And so you can have him sit through classes all you want on how to be a good dad. He, he will not learn in a class. He's got to see one. He's got to watch one be a good dad. And so, you know, he lived with us for a while. And now I don't know that he had to live with us to learn it. It does make it a little bit easier because he gets to see everything. But even if he didn't live with us, he'd have to come over for meals. He'd have to watch what I do with my kids when I put them to bed. He'd have to see my wife and I engage. And, and it just happened that he and his wife did live with us. And so we'd be having a fight and they'd go, hey, we're just going to excuse ourselves and head downstairs and... And we said, no, you stay right there. <laughs> and they would watch us fight. And I'd say, you're never going to learn how to have a fight and deal with sin and brokenness between two people unless you watch it happen. So stay here. And <laughs> so they did. And they'd watch us fight, and they'd watch it get resolved with the gospel. And, uh, and you know, they watched me screw up, and they watched me ask my wife to forgive me, and they saw me confess my sin, and... They saw us pray together, and I remember there was a day when we were having a fight, and they, didn't, they not only didn't say, hey, we're going to go, they actually stopped and said, hey, we'd like to help you. Can we give you some reflections on what we've seen between you guys? And all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, now the student gets to teach the teachers, you know, and, and they began to now apply everything they'd been learning to our marriage. And I was like, okay, yes, we're getting there now. Now they can help others in their marriages, and they can help others in their conflict, because they've been with us long enough to be able to do it with someone else. Yeah. Jeff, I'm not sure if other people are thinking this, but at this point we feel, um, how far do we have to get before we want to let someone in? <laughs> <You know? laughs> yeah. We're, we're still got 10 years before we get there. We're trying to teach well, you where we're trying to get <laughs> <laughs> It's on your camera. Sorry about that. <laughs> sharing, sharing everything with us. Um, well, yeah, I, I mean, I, that's, why, that's why I preface it and say I'm not sure everybody has to have someone live with them. Um, the, the way we got there didn't start with, hey, I, it's nice to meet you, come live with us. It, <laughs> it, it started with Randy coming to our church because his brother, who wasn't a, yet a Christian, invited him. And Randy was a Christian, but a pretty young one. And um, Randy was, it was an interesting kind of spirit-led moment because he would tell you it was the la he was never going to come to our church gatherings ever again because he was so tired of hearing about mission and he saw this kind of teaching that engaged the people and would let people interrupt and he's just like, tell them to shut up, you know, like, you're the preacher, they need to shut up and listen. And he, ha he had a very kind of domineering, like controlling picture of spiritual leadership and he thought that's what it should be like. And I, we weren't doing that. So there was a lot of things he didn't like about our church. So he told me that was going to be the last day he ever came and the spirit very clearly told me, go talk to him right now. And it was like, it was one of those moments where the, I was almost like there was a light over the guy, you know, it was like I couldn't miss him. And so I went over and said, hey, let's sit down and eat. And we used, we used to have a meal at the end of our gathering, so we sat down and ate together. And, and um, after that, it led to me, him saying he wanted to talk more. And so we started, I pulled him in to a couple other guys I was meeting with, and we started meeting weekly. And he was a real pain in the butt, to be honest. Like, I, I wanted to punch him half the time, because he was... He, every, he pushed against everything. He was really arrogant. He thought he knew everything. Everything I did was wrong. Everything he did was right. And I just kept going, okay, well, open your Bible and show me where you came up with that. And, and he didn't have anything for it. And then I'd say, okay, well, how about if I at least show you why we believe this according to the scriptures? And I would bring him to it. And we did that for probably three or four months. And then I met his, his girlfriend, Lisa, and uh, he wanted us to meet her. So we met her. And so then she started coming into our life, and they both started coming into our missional community and hanging out with us, and she started to hang out with my wife, and I started, I, he and I had started praying together a couple times a week, a few other guys, and, and then pretty soon she, we were on our fire pit one night, and there was a young man who came to us and said, you know, I, I think I'm supposed to live with you guys. I need a place to live, and I know you guys open up your home, and I, I'd love to do that. And Lisa spoke up. She said, I don't think he's the guy that's supposed to live with you. I think I'm supposed to live with you. And, and so Janie and I went and prayed, and and the Lord made it really clear she was supposed to live with us, so we had her live with us. And uh, so now Randy's at our house all the time because his girlfriend's there. And uh, she didn't have a strong spiritual father, spiritual leader as a father, and of course he didn't have a good picture of spiritual leadership. So their, their dating relationship was a mess. And there were several times I had to step in 
and protect her from him. I remember one particular time um, he kept comparing her to other women and kept saying, like, how do I know if there's not another woman out there that's more beautiful that I'm going to be attracted to other than her? And I remember when he said that, I said, you get out of our house and don't you ever come back and date her again until you can be convinced you're not going to look at another woman and compare Lisa to her. So if your eyes aren't only for her, then you don't get to be with her anymore. And I remember she told me, she told us the other day, she was rehearsing that story with the community, and uh, she said, that was the first time I ever felt protected and loved by a father. And she said, it's what, it's what changed our whole relationship. And then Randy came back to me and he said, I'm sorry. And I, mean, I said, you've got to talk to her. You've got to tell her you're sorry. She doesn't need you to compare her anymore. So if she's, I said, you don't even deserve her, just so it's clear. Like, she is beautiful, and she is growing in Christ-likeness, and you think that you could find better? You're a fool, man. This girl is amazing. So, like, you better honor her and protect her, or we're not going to let you be with her anymore. And he, he heard it, man, and it was great, because I saw a change in how he cherished her. And um, so then, eventually, they got married, and so this is like a year and a half by the time he finally moved in, maybe two years. And... Uh, he, they, so they didn't move, she, he didn't move in with her until they got married. And then they lived with us for a year. So it was a lot of time leading up to that. Um, and I suppose with that, part of my question is, um, we're, we're journeying to, to the point, or many of us are, that we're seeking to be living out the gospel in a way that we would want people to see. Like I see, that. yeah. And so in part... So it's not just... How long did it take, does it take to have a person that you're welcoming into your home? It's how long does it take for me to be a person who's willing to welcome anybody? Yeah, so we don't completely ruin <laughs> yeah. Oh, you guys won't. Uh, here's the thing I want to encourage you in. The, the gospel is so amazing that when you're horrible, it looks great. Because you just need it. And so you go like, yeah, we're a mess around here. We, we love Jesus and we screw up all the time. And so like you get to boast in your weakness and that makes Christ look amazing and when you get it right, you get to boast in Jesus because he must have done it. So either way, I, I think that's the thing that we got to get over that there isn't, there, I mean, if you can't, I remember one of the women who was in our missional community, it's so funny, I was going to put this in my book, my wife said it sounded a little self-serving so I'm not doing that, but um, <laughs> by the way, you'll just have everybody, have your wife read your book and tell her how much you, she hates it and then you'll go, get a humbled she doesn't hate it. She doesn't tell me that, but she corrects me a lot. That's not how it happened. Okay. Um, and, uh, yeah. And, but she, uh, this one woman in our group said, I don't understand why anybody would ever fly you to another part of the world to have you speak. And I'm like, what do you mean? She goes like, don't they know who you are? You're just a mess. And I go, no, they don't. But you do. So I, 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 you know, I take the, just take the pressure off yourself. You're, the, the point isn't that you live a perfect life. The point is that you love Jesus and that you experience grace together. That's the point. And that's, that's what everybody longs for. So if people get to be brought into a, broke, a bunch of broken people's lives, they believe that they can also be a Christian who's broken. But if you have it all together, gosh, I don't know. I don't want to be around you personally. <laughs> I want to be around people who need Jesus, not people who don't need Jesus, you know, so. So anyway, hopefully that encourages you. Like, don't, you don't have to have your life together. You just got to have Jesus and then be people who boast in him, so. So yeah, life on life. And, um, you know, I could tell you story after story after story of, of what Randy learned both through my failures and through our successes, you know. I'm, I'm, I'm growing as a dad, and so it's funny. It's amazing how you can sit in a classroom and people can talk about how to have, like, devotional times with your family around the table. And man, when you're in the classroom, it sounds like a Norman Rockwell painting, you know? Like, like that's amazing. You know, like they sit quietly and you ask a question and they all answer in turn and <laughs> no one interrupts and there's no spilled milk or food flying across the table and, you know, and they just sit there. And then you sing a song and they pull out their <laughs> hymn books and they all sing four-part harmonies and, you know, and it's like, that's amazing. I'm going to do that. And then you go home and you're like, okay, kids, we're going to read the Bible tonight. I don't want to. Yeah. Okay, what do I do about that? Um, <laughs> you know, and that's, it's, it's, not, it's not what you think it is. It's hard. It's messy. And so, so how did Randy learn how to do daily devotions or times around the table with, the, with my kids around the Word? He watched me and he saw it was a mess. And now it's, he could do it. 
Because he's like, oh, cool, it doesn't have to look like a perfect worship service with a liturgy. And, you know, like, it could just be like, you got like two minutes of a little bit of talk about Jesus, and then they got in a fight, and then you had to help them, like, repent and love one another. You're like, oh, that was a great family devotion time. You know, like, so when I think he saw that, he's like, okay, I think I could do that. And, you know, he watched me with my kids, and each night I go and I cuddle with each kid in a unique way, because one of my kids receives love in different ways, and and then I pray with him at the, the bedtime. And so I'd say, every once in a while, I'd say, hey, Randy, come on up. Like, now, he didn't get in the bed and cuddle, just so it's clear. Um, but we'd sit around, and, I, and I'd wrestle with Caleb. And, of course, Randy started wrestling with Caleb. And, and, and you know, he, that's Caleb's love language, is like physical touch in, a, in a, like a, a manly way, you know? And he loves that, you know? And so Randy and I are both wrestling. We're having fun. And it's okay, buddy, let's stop and pray. And we're doing it together. And Randy's going, oh, okay, I can do that. And... So he's also learning, like, and that's what dads do. And that's, we can teach our kids about prayer through fun. And, you know, we're out in the backyard. And you row, you know, like, that's why Caleb loves you. Because you did it too. You know, you just engaged in my son's life. And now you got him wrapped around your little finger. <laughs> no, I'm not kidding. You're, like, and you're a winsome guy. That's part of it. But you, you took time to play soccer with him. And, and all of a sudden, you, if you wanted to, you could disciple my son just like that. Because... You want his heart. Well, you obviously have seen that somewhere or learned that somewhere. You know, I have a feeling. I know where. Um, and so, um, well, men need to see that. A lot of men have never seen that. So, so yeah, that's, that's life on life stuff. So, your hand went up. Yeah. I just thought um, whether you could talk to Michael Hargraves about changing the music on your 14 minute video so it's not so nice to Jaws. <laughs> just start to be more realistic for us. Yeah, I know. I went back to Todd and I said, I don't know what it is. I, I've never picked any of this music, but it all seems to sound the same. It's like so nice and ooh. So anyway. Yeah, maybe you can help us with that. <laughs> you just wanted to jab them. That's what you want to do. So life on life. Now, here's the deal. It can't, that can't happen in a classroom. I'm not anti-classroom. We're obviously experiencing kind of a classroom a thing today. I think it's important. Classrooms expose you to truth. They might correct your wrong thinking. There's all that. That's, that's valuable. It's just very, very insufficient for making disciples. You can't make disciples in a classroom. You can inform them what a disciple might be like. You can talk about what they should learn. You can develop some the theology or you know, good teaching, but you just can't see if they're believing it. The only way you know if they're believing it is if you watch them live. You know, you don't, the only way you know if people believe this stuff is you're with them to know, do you really believe God loves you like a father? Well, I'll know. I'll, I'll pray with you and find out. You know, do you re that's what I do with Randy. You really believe that the son served you, so now you are called to be a servant to those that God puts in the way of your life, the Samaritan story? Well, no, because like with Randy, I, we all started working on the side of my house to restore a 100-year-old home. And I remember I came home one day, and he's up on a 20-foot ladder plugging holes with putty all by himself, and he's angry. I said, how you doing, bud? I'm mad. Why? No one's here. Why, is, why are you angry about that? Well, people said they're going to be here. Well, so they aren't. They aren't here. Why does that make you so angry? Well, because they're not here. And I said, well, you agreed to help out, right? Yeah, so you're doing what you said you're going to do, right? Yeah. So why are you angry? Well, because nobody else is here. I said, but why does that bother you so much? And then I walk. I said, I'll be right back. <laughs> I've learned sometimes you have to ask the question and walk away. You know, just like, I want you to think about that. I'll be back in a little bit. And I came back and he said, I know why I'm so mad. Because nobody's noticing what I'm doing. I'm doing it all alone. And nobody knows. I said, you know, but nobody else. And I said, so the real problem is you're still living for someone else's approval. You don't know that the Father loves you and accepts you and he's been watching you all along and whether or not you did it with a good attitude or not, he still loves you. And he actually loves the guys who didn't show up too because he doesn't love us based upon how well we work and... So that's your real problem, right? And he goes, yeah. I said, well, how do we repent of that? Like, what does it look like to turn to a God who loves you, not for what you're working, how well you do and what work you do, but because of Jesus and the work he did already? And so we, he got down from the ladder, and we spent some time talking to Jesus about the Father's love, 
that doesn't look at our work as the merit for his affection. And that was, that was in the middle of life. The funny thing is, is the joke around our, the people that I get to pour my life into is they say, I, I kinda, I'm kind of like a Mr. Miyagi of discipleship, you know, like people don't know they're getting discipled in the middle of the normal everyday stuff of life. And I just want to encourage you, look at everyday normal stuff of life as the best place to do discipleship. Because everybody can pretend like they believe everything when they're here. You know, and they're at a gathering or when you're talking, you know, you're in a classroom talking about walking by the Spirit. Like, oh yeah, Galatians, I'm all into that. <laughs> it's when you're walking with life and in life and you see that they don't know how to walk in the Spirit because half the time they're blowing it and, you know, blowing a gasket and yelling at everybody and angry and so easily controlled by their flesh. And you go, okay, now let's talk about how do we walk in the Spirit because that's where we want to learn how to do it is in life. And so I want to encourage you, like, the classroom that you want people in is the classroom of life. That's the best place to train people. Parents, you know this, because the best place to train your kids is not at the dinner table, though that's important. It's when they're <coughs> fighting with their, their brother or sister over a toy, or when they're mad because they didn't get what they wanted, and that's when the real stuff is happening. So use those opportunities, create those opportunities. Second, it's life and community. If it would have been just me discipling Randy, who would Randy most look like? Me. me. Who do I want him to look like? Jesus. Jesus. How is he going to look like Jesus? He needs his body. He needs the body pouring into him and discipling him. The number of times, if Randy were here, he would tell you, I definitely had an influence on his life, but he would probably say my wife Janie maybe had a bigger influence in terms of the way she would speak into his life and confront him in some areas. And she just has a real prophetic kind of voice. Uh, and she has that kind of calling. And God really uses her. And he needed that because he's, that, he's got the same kind of calling. He's very prophetic in his abilities and so God really used her to help grow him up in that particular gifting and uh, and not only her Lisa and I mean I could you know Nikki and a whole, whole bunch of other people that were in Randy's life got to pour into him and develop him and he is a better man because of many people discipling him not just one and so I'd encourage you guys to think through how does life and community really work I remember a guy his name is Josh was in our missional community and he had been trained under um, Ray Comfort. Do you guys know who that is? So he had a lot of, he was a street preaching kind of guy. And he actually had a box and he would get on it. And, and then he would, you know, start just yelling really loud. And people would come. And, and then he kind of tricked them into confessing that they had done something wrong. And then he would tell them that, you know, well, because of that, you're going to go to hell. And, but here's what Jesus did. And, and, he said, and he, no one hardly ever accomplished anything. He'd always go like, I'd say, how'd it go down at the park? He's like, well, no one responded, but I did my job, so I'm innocent of the blood of the people there. And I'm like, is your goal to be innocent of their blood or is your goal that they would come to know the love of Christ? Because if you're going to use that quote, Paul was in Ephesus for two years, day in and day out, loving those people, and he said to them, you saw how I lived amongst you, and he left with tears. He loved them, and they loved him. And it was, I said, that, I don't see that in you. I don't see a deep love for these people. And so he came into our missional community and our missional community started to disciple him and pour into him and challenge him to learn how to love people and learn how to invite people into his life. And it was super hard for him. And I remember we had a couple that we were reaching out to in our neighborhood and they came to one of our, they were having, we were going through the, I think the story of God at one point. And they, um, if you don't know what that is, that's kind of just a narrative of God's redemptive plan from Genesis to Revelation that we walk through with people. And uh, he cornered them at one part of the night, and he just nailed them. Uh, it was, their names are Jim and Carrie, and, and Jim was really kind of interested in a lot of Eastern religions, so he had a, a lot of Buddhism kind of influencing his, his thinking. And Josh immediately went after that and kind of just tore them apart. And um, the next week we get together and they don't show up. And so my wife checks in and finds out that they said, we're not coming back because that guy really hurt us. So the week after that, Janie is very clear with Josh about what happened, and she was fairly direct <laughs> about what happened there, and he just started to cry. And he really, he really wept, actually, over his sin and over the way it hurt people, and it led people to walk away from Jesus. And I was thankful for that, because it was like, finally, he's caring, you know, it's his heart is engaged in these people's lives, and they walked away because he was a jerk, and he really hurt them. And uh, so then he called them and asked them to forgive him, and, and then they showed up again 
a few weeks later, and they eventually came to faith. And, and, and he was able to see that and watch what happened. And what, what was lovely about that is that wouldn't have happened if Josh would have been allowed to just be a standalone evangelist all by himself. But because he was in the community, he couldn't get away with that anymore because we were not going to let him. Here's the deal. A lot of us don't have a clue how ineffective people are actually at making disciples because we're never with them long enough to see what they're doing. You know, Which leads to the last one, and that is life on mission. While you're on the mission, the stuff that's really broken usually shows up. That's the beauty. If you want to disciple people and you never ever make disciples with them or they, you're never with unbelievers with them or you're never you know, engaged in the, the stuff of training up people, you'll never really know how selfish and arrogant and insecure and fearful they are. That all shows up when you're with each other enough on mission. It's like if you just go, like a missional community is just a bunch of Christians who like to hang out together, you're still not going to find out how broken they are because it's still all about them. Once it starts being about someone other than them, then you'll start to realize how selfish we are. Uh, and all you got to do is go on a mission trip with a group of people. If you've ever directed one of those, you know, like, you know, everyone's like, it's going to be amazing. We're going to Costa Rica, you know. And I remember I took a group of students to Costa Rica, and, you know, you train them in the language, and, you, you know, you talk about how you're going to share the gospel, and you learn some crazy mime and, you know, a bunch of other weird things that we did, you know. And I like, still can't believe we did that. But... But, you know, and then you take off and you land and someone's luggage gets lost and immediately, like, people lose it, <laughs> right? And then they, they get dropped off at their host homes and you show up later that night and they're like, they don't even, you know, they don't even realize I have a paleo that, or that I have a special diet that I'm, I, I, I can't have gluten. I'm a gluten-free guy, you know, and did you see the bugs at their house? And like, man, I have to share a bedroom with somebody, you know, and all of a sudden, all of it starts coming out, right? I love that about a mission trip. And then... Usually it's about day two or three and people are getting on each other's nerves and they're tired and they're frustrated and people have been mean to each other and they've told people to shut up. I don't want to hear from you again. You know, and all, all the, and you're, if you're a leader, you're like, if you don't know what you're up to, like if you think the mission was Costa Rica, then you missed the point. Because all the people that you go on a mission trip to, they don't even give you the best stuff. They keep you out like painting someone's house that's far away from their mission because they know you're going to destroy it. That's just the truth, man, like, just so you know. Like, you think you're doing, oh, we're coming in, woo! You're not. They're like, we don't even trust you guys. You're like, would you just let anybody come in and get really close to the people you've been pouring your life into? They don't either. So they, they usually keep you at arm's distance. The mission trip is for the people who are on the mission, not the people you're going to. That's really how it works. And so if you're a leader, you know that, and you're like, I'm waiting for it all to hit the fan, and then the real stuff's going to happen. Then we're going to talk about grace and forgiveness. And we're going to learn how to pray together. And we're going to learn how to be gracious and, and patient. And we're going we're to realize how selfish and prideful we really are. And then we're going to talk about why are we so prideful and selfish. And why did we think we were the saviors coming to Costa Rica when really we were the ones who needed the savior. And all that stuff starts to happen when you're on mission because all the stuff that's in the heart finally comes out. Don't you love it that Jesus wasn't, didn't spend as much time just trying to put stuff into their heart? A lot of what he did with the disciples was trying to draw out what was already in the heart. Remember, he says it's not what goes into a heart that corrupts him, it's what comes out of the heart. Um, and so what was he doing? He was drawing out the heart, because out of the heart flows the wellspring of life. You know, that's where it comes out of. And so our job is to let the heart come out. And there's nothing like mission for making the heart show up, because all of it will come out, I promise you. And as we keep talking through this today, just try and get a group of people to actually be united on a mission and you'll find out how selfish and prideful and arrogant we are. I mean, it won't take long until the sin's going to show up. Now, the beauty is the gospel is plenty sufficient to, to be great, bring grace to their problems and to remind them of who they are in Christ and to help them live out their new identity and not the, the, the flesh and the old one. So, so life on life, life in community, life on mission. Hopefully you're realizing already that you can't have this kind of growing in our identity and that kind of experience for disciple-making if you don't have something that actually can contain life on life, life in community, life on mission. So like a large group gathering can't do that by itself. Classroom can't do that. In fact, let me back up. You can't even do one-on-one -on -one discipleship and get this. So if you think one-on-one -on -one discipleship will create a fully formed disciple, you're, you're, you're fooling yourself because they're going to look mostly like you and largely they're just going to learn how to parrot back to you the things you've taught them. And you don't know if they're living it, and you don't know if they could live with anybody other than you. And a lot of times, they just look up to you. 
And so they're just kind of like, you know, wow, I, just want, to, I want Jeff to be proud of me. And so, yeah, I'm going to learn, and I'm going to apply it. And, or, you know, I, I, he's holding me accountable. And so what do we do? It's like, I don't watch his life, but I hear about what he does all week long. I don't have a clue what's going on. I need to get in his life, and I'm going to see it. So, so you need something more than that. And that's why we landed... For our own conviction on missional community, it wasn't, just so it's clear, it wasn't, hey, what's a new program for the church or what's a new methodology? It was saying the mission is making disciples who make disciples. We want to establish them in this so they'll live out this. How are we going to do that? And what's amazing is when you look at the biblical narrative, the household was the best way to do it. And the household in the, in the Bible was not just a husband, wife, and a couple kids, a picket fence, and a nice dog. It was a community that usually was anywhere between 25 to 50 people that were connected to one another. There was an immediate family, but then there was an extended family. There was, there was servants and household help, helpers. There was strangers that came from out and became a part of it. Household was much more than just husband, wife, and a few kids. And uh, when we read that, we read it in light of our Western view of family. When a, Hugh, a Jewish person read that, they read it in light of their view of family, which was way bigger than ours. So when you, when you see an elder saying, hey, they can lead a church now because they can lead a household, it's not just they could lead a few people. It's that they could lead a community to be a family together, and they could help them grow up into Christ-likeness. So we, we realized we've got to create a place where that can happen because how else are we ever going to raise up elders if we can't, first of all, see if they can be tested to lead a household? So for us, that's really what a missional community is. Let me define it the way we define it and then walk through what we believe it's not primarily. And I hate doing the negation of it, but I've learned that even when I say missional community, some of you have in your mind a picture of something that isn't what I mean. So I'm going to try and clarify it. So we define it as pretty easy. Family of missionary servants sent as disciples who make disciples. Okay, so they love one another like a family. They have a people group God is sending them to to reach to make disciples of. And they're going to show what the kingdom of God looks like in tangible form as servants. And all along they know they are disciples who do make disciples. So a family of missionary servants sent as disciples who make disciples. To clarify, I just want to be clear, what we believe about missional community is that it's not primarily a small group. Okay, It's not just a smaller version of a big thing. It's not just a small group, which, by the way, when you talk about, I don't know if it's true for your context, but in your context, what is a, what, who's the small group primarily about in most churches? The Christians, right. So that's when we say it's not a small group, it's not primarily just existing for Christians. Or I know at least the churches I was a part of that were larger, they put small groups in place as a form of kind of retention, you know, to... They used to say to close the back door. You know, it allowed people to feel connected and not just you know, not leave because they feel like they're not getting to experience community together. So we're not saying it's primarily that. Though it, there, there, it will be probably small and there'll be Christians in it. Okay? We also don't believe it's primarily a Bible study. Okay? Um, they will study the Bible. They'll devote themselves to obey the Bible. But in many cases, at least where I'm from, I would bet we're fa fairly similar Bible studies in most churches are people who get together and talk about the scriptures. They don't devote themselves to obey them together. And in fact, if I were going to make a shift in a church that has small groups that study the Bible together, one big shift I would make, and I, it could change the group significantly if you just made this shift, is to say, every time we study the Bible, we're going to ask, how are we collectively going to obey this while we're out in the world amongst unbelievers? That'd be one shift I'd make. How are we collectively going to obey this while we are out on the mission with unbelievers? Um, and the reason why I say that is because the Bible really wasn't written primarily to any individual to be kind of other than maybe Philemon and Timothy uh, and Titus. You know, there's a few in there that are pastoral letters to a particular person. But even in those letters, it was, to be, it was to be applied to a people. They were actually written to a collective community. And so the intent of Scripture is to obey it together, not to obey it as an individual. But so much of our individualistic Western worldview has taught us to read the Bible as though it applies to me instead of it applies to us. Okay, so like even when you read, like, don't, don't let the devil get a stronghold. Most people think that means be careful in your own spiritual life that he doesn't get a stronghold in your heart. It's actually referring to the community and how he wants to get in between us and divide us. 
And so it's a communal text about spiritual warfare. And so all of a sudden you go like, okay, how do we make sure he doesn't get in between us? And what we tend to do is say it's about me. So you, it's amazing how many Christians in the Western context read the Bible as a personal text to apply to their personal life. And the majority of it is meant to be applied in a communal sense to our lives together. Okay, that, that alone will shift you in a big way towards being a missional community. So let's apply it to us together. And then the second is, remember Jesus when he says in John 17, Father, I pray for them that you don't take, don't take them out of the world. Leave them in the world. And then what does he say will sanctify us? Is it removal? A lot of people think sanctification is being removed from the world. That's not actually what it means. Sanctification is being set apart for God in the middle of the world for God's purposes. Jesus says in John 17, your word is what sanctifies them. So now keep that in mind. He's saying sanctification is God's people in the middle of the world set apart for God's purposes who are sanctified by the word while they're together in the world. Do you see what he's saying? He's saying the Bible is meant to, to set you apart as God's people while you're on mission, while you're in the middle of the world together. And I'll tell you, the implications of God's word, when people read it, expecting to live it in the middle of the world together, well, it'll change how they read their Bible. Because they won't, they'll, they'll actually go like, oh, now I get. I mean, it was what the conversation, I don't know if it was you and I or who it was, but we were talking about why Israel had to, what they did, they were meant to be a, a testimony of the nations. They'll understand how God's word shapes the people to be glorifying God so the nations come to know him. It'll change the way they think about how they read the Bible. Does that make sense? But most Bible studies don't do that at all. They just sit around and talk about the text. No, no expectation that people are going to obey it. Certainly not obey it together. And I'm almost positive they almost never talk about how we're going to obey it on mission with unbelievers. So just change that, and you'll, have a big, you'll, you'll move it towards a missional community just with that alone. Okay? Uh, next, it's not primarily a support group. Um, I, I'm thinking of, like, I think of AA. You know, AA exists to continue to come around our brokenness. So like, hi, I'm Jeff, I'm an alcoholic. How about, hi, I'm Jeff, I'm a child of God. And I struggle with alcohol. But I'm not building a group around my sin. I'm building a group around Jesus. And oftentimes support groups become groups that just continue to come around their brokenness as the centerpiece for why they'd get together instead of around Jesus who can change our brokenness. So I encourage you. They might have, they're going to have support. You're going to have broken people because we're all broken. But you've got to be careful that you don't build it around the brokenness. In fact, what I've seen happen a lot of times in missional communities is they'll just become a confessional group about their brokenness and you'll have to you'll be like a care group that every time you're together, you're just trying to make sure you do counseling to everybody. It becomes a group counseling session. Guarantee you, if you try to make, keep doing that, you'll never, ever get people out on mission. Because it's, I mean, it's just a new form of kind of, I mean, you ever seen Fight Club? I mean, I know it's a little crass and all that, but the whole point of that is narcissism expressed in community. And for a lot of us, that's what, that's what a, a group becomes, is narcissistic. This is all about me having a place. It's cheers again, where everyone knows my name, you know. And I will tell you this as a pause. If you, are, if you think that missional communities will, will, like, cut out the heart of consumeristic Christians, you're wrong. Because what it is, it's an easier way for it to be more all about them. Because in a larger church, it's like, Gosh, I'm just, I really like this church. They thought about me and the way they did the music and the preaching seems to hit me at the heart. And Oh, and then my kids have a great program. That's awesome. You mean I could have a group that's only 20 people that thinks about me all the time? <laughs> wow, that's even better. And so what you'll do if you're not careful is you'll attract people who, are, who are, want the group to be all about them where everyone knows their name because that's what they've been taught the church is all about. And so if you're not careful, you'll just create an, another form of a consumeristic church, but it's even more broken because it really becomes all about us. So that's a real tendency. Now, we are going to have broken people. We do need to do gospel-centered counseling. We do need to be committed to people's health. You are going to have to slow down when you experience brokenness in the group, but you've got to be careful that you don't let the brokenness of the group be the center point. Jesus has to remain it. So you know, you, you've seen the video. You've seen Nikki. Nikki's a very broken woman who I love very much, and sometimes I have a hard time loving her. I'll be real honest. And there are days when she wants to make the group all about her, just like there are days when I want the group to be all about me. 
And we have to both be committed to say, it can't be all about us. And those are moments that are hard, you know? Like when you go, okay, Nikki, we need to take some more time at another time to pray through this, but right now, we need to have this conversation about this other issue. And so, by the way, you're going to see this, which I'm just going to jump to it because it's at the bottom. When you start thinking of a missional community in these ways, you realize you can't have a missional community just be a weekly meeting. Because if you try to make it a weekly meeting, you're going to try and accomplish everything in two hours. And I guarantee you, you will not do it. And it'll, it'll always gravitate to one of the things that's important. Okay, well, now we just do a Bible study once a week. Oh, now we just do a, a counseling support group once a week. Or now we, we do like a social activism thing. We just go and serve the poor once a week. But you've got to look at a mission community as a group of people who are living life on mission together all week long in the, the flow of life, just like a family would be. Okay? So if you try to cram it into a weekly meeting, I guarantee you you're going to be very frustrated. Um, so it's not primarily a weekly meeting. Um, and that, 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 by the way, is one of our biggest challenges. I'll tell you, even, even for us, regularly, I'll hear people say, are we having missional community tonight? And the way I respond back is, are we having Vanderstelts tonight? In other words, the missional community is the missional community whether we get together or not. Um, for us, in the summer, we change the pace of our life together as a missional community, and it's, we just go, hey, let's just hang out and have cookouts and barbecues and you know, late nights around the fire and some, have s'mores for the kids and let's just have a fun time. Can we just be that? And people love it. It's like not everything has to be a structured program. And I think when you can learn how to be with each other and love one another and just enjoy life together, then you get out of this meeting mentality and you start just being brothers and sisters. And sometimes you have to have a more formal structured discussion or a, a study or a focused uh, event. But when you learn how to be together in all the ways of life, then, then you can have those and they can be what they are. A limited time together where you try to accomplish one or two things. But then people don't feel like, gosh, that wasn't a very good night because we didn't, we didn't disciple our kids and we didn't pray for healing and we didn't counsel anybody and no one came to faith and there wasn't a Bible study and we didn't have a worship time. And you know, you're going like, how am I going to pull all this off in two hours? You know, I can't. And so then you relax and then you get to be the church. And you know what's amazing is the early church, they, they had a kind of a life that was flowing together in all kinds of ways. I mean, they, they enjoyed life. Man, how fun would it be if we just enjoyed life together? Yeah, we'll get to that a little bit. Yes. I was just thinking this to me sounds a bit like a little village. Yeah. Like, that's the way I'm seeing it. Yeah. Just a, it's just a community of people that you live with, so you help out in the garden, or someone so has some veggies to give to you, and then you have some, like a, yeah. Anyway, kind of yeah. yeah, it's a good, it's a good image. Yeah, yeah. I, I think, I think people want to be a part of something like that. They really do. You don't get to know kids into a like, so you know, and it's constantly getting picked up, and so you like, I was picking them up during the week. That's when I got to know. I was sitting in the car and I was hitting each other. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and, and that's fine. Like you say to them, that's fine because we're learning to do life together. But if you try and you won't know kids, and you really need to know kids on a real. Yeah. They won't trust you until you live in their life. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's right. Yeah, and you really get to disciple each other when you're yeah. in those kinds of places. And learn how they parent. That's yeah. right. And I think you cover all the gaps that people are missing. Yeah. Yeah. And here's the other thing. Don't, don't hear this wrong. Um, we don't all have to be all together all the time. That's the other thing that's nice. It's like... Like when people say, are we having a missional community? It's like, well, let's get rid of that language. Are we all getting together th- tonight or not? No. Some of us are going to have dinner, and a few others are going to go to a movie, and then some others are going to watch each other's kids so someone can have a date night. And Oh, man, that's a great night. We're loving one another like a family. You know. And then he- here's the thing that I've found is people are plenty busy. They don't need a whole lot of more activity added to their life. They just need to learn how to live their life with gospel intentionality, not alone. That's a big part of what the church needs, is learn how to live their life with gospel intentionality, not in isolation. they got a group of people that are with them, walking in life with them, have the freedom to interrupt their lives once in a while, or to say, no, I can't be interrupted. I mean, I mean, someone was telling me one time, they're like, it feels like, like you're, you're, you must have a revolving door. I'm like, no, I have a closed door. Sometimes I open it, sometimes I keep it closed. And we used to have a joke with our mission community that we'd, if the, the drapes were closed, if the curtains were closed, 
something else is going on. <laughs> so you're not to interrupt. <laughs> so we just had this, because that's what family does, right? You, my kids, you know, like, if they want to interrupt mommy and daddy on a date, no, we're on a date. You know, you have, we have a babysitter or something. And that's okay. That's what family does. There's seasons and rhythms of life. Okay? All right? So it's primary, also not primarily a social activist group. I remember we had a group that saw like their mission as the AIDS hospice, and I was coaching them about how they were doing, and I met with them and said, hey, tell me about the people that you're reaching out to. <coughs> and at one point, you know, they just said, well, what are you talking about? And I said, well, the people in the AIDS hospice. And they said, oh, you misunderstood. Our mission is the AIDS hospice, the house, the grounds. We're trimming the rose bushes, taking care of the gardens, painting the building. That's our mission. I said, well, there's people in there that are dying. They, I'm sure that they could use a friend that's going to come and sit by their bedside or pray with them or you know, just be a, when they're all alone. And I said, oh, well, we, we weren't making the mission them. We were just making the mission the house. And it's beautiful. <laughs> and it, I'm telling you, like, I come, I'm running into a lot of that right now where people are like, we, we, we go and do this mission, this project, and that's our mission. It's like, no, the people are the mission, and the project is the means of showing the kingdom of God breaking in to say that God loves you and he cares about all things, including the house you're living in and the rose bushes. But he did, we don't do that at the expense of people. We love people. I remember I had a group of guys tell me, I was in California speaking, they came to me and said, man, we love what you're talking about. We're all about this. We, we're involved in mission in the skid row of L.A. We help the homeless people there. And I'm like, that's awesome. We were in Simi Valley. So that's, that's like way outside of L.A., a long way outside. It's like the safest city or suburb in the whole United States, you know, and and uh, it's where Francis Chan used to be at. So that's I was invited to speak at his church, and uh, and uh, uh, they said I said really do you guys did you guys drive out here from the city, and they said no 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 we live in Simi Valley. I said I'm really confused. How in the world are you missionaries to Skid Row but you live in Simi Valley? Do you guys spend most of your week down there? They said no 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 we drive in like once or twice a month and go and feed the homeless there. I said that's not your mission. You can't be on mission to a group of people you don't know and you never live with. If you want to be on mission there, you're going to have to move and be there amongst them long enough to actually get to know them. And I said, it sounds to me like your mission are the people who are driving to Skid Row and the people who are driving back. You're discipling them on how to care for the poor. And that's okay, too. Just don't call Skid Row your mission, okay, because it's not. It's good that you're doing that kind of service and you're teaching people how to feed and care for those who don't have as much. That's great. Now, there's probably some things we need to confront about that because there probably was maybe some self-righteousness and savior mentality that kind of slips in, I think, to a lot of us Christians who like to sweep in and be the answer and then leave. Um, and it's not how Jesus did it. He, he lived amongst us. You know, He didn't just come and go. So, so that needs to be confronted. That will be a tendency, by the way, of a lot of people because it's still that kind of event mentality. Kind of go do it and then get out of it. And uh, I can guarantee you that will be a hard thing to break because we're so used to it being an event or a project. So, all right, I'm going to move on to how we begin to form and build these. Do we need to take a break? I know that after lunch it sits in and you guys are going, <laughs> you know, I know that happens. Are we okay? You want to take a little break? Stand up, stretch break, let's do that. Uh, so 2.30 we'll be back again. <laughs>